Ladies and gentlemen, we ask you for a round of applause to Professor Adi Aran from Shar Zedek Medical Center. <laughs> Welcome, Professor. Hi, thank, thank you. you. Good morning, and I want to thank the organizers for this excellent organization and for inviting me here to Lisbon. And uh, I am going to talk about the roles of the endocannabinoid system in the pathogenesis of autism spectrum disorder, and I will present two clinical studies on cannabinoid treatment in autism spectrum disorder, or ASD. So I have some disclosures that you should see. Okay. So, as you probably know, currently there is a hype about marijuana, both recreational marijuana and also medical marijuana. I prefer the term medical cannabis, it sounds more medicinal. So we can understand why recreational marijuana is so uh, popular, but why is medical uh, marijuana or medical cannabis so popular? So there are some very good reasons, if, as we have already uh, heard from Dr. Sanchez, and we will probably hear in the next uh, talks, uh, but some uh, families, some uh, patients prefer medical cannabis because it is perceived as natural and innocent as opposed to the evil chemical drugs. So I want to start my talk by emphasizing that this reason is not true, especially not in children when the brain is still under construction and we are worried about any interference. In the next uh, 45 minutes, I will speak about the evidence of cannabinoid treatment in ASD. Why should it work? Is it working indeed? And more important, is it safe? Or at least as important, is it safe? So usually when we develop a new treatment, we start with preclinical studies, then we move on to phase one studies. Is it safe in affected humans? Then to phase two. Is it working? Phase three, efficacy and safety in larger group of patients. And only then after crossing all these rivers, if we do, we move on to marketing. This was definitely not the case with medical cannabis in autism. In this case, we kind of put the cart before the horse. There are so many information on the web about medical cannabis and autism, but clinical studies, not so many. And this is a real problem. First, we need the evidence, of course, and as Richard Cochrane used to say, the plural of evidence or the plural of anecdote is not evidence. Second, there are risks, of course, and many studies indicate that consumption of recreational, recreational marijuana at a young age is associated with certain risks. There is a risk for addiction during childhood or youth. This risk might reach 50% with a a daily use of recreational marijuana because of the THC. A cognitive decline, a mild cognitive decline, I must say, might appear after years of heavy use of recreational marijuana. Uh, this is still controversial. The more prominent risk with chronic use of recreational marijuana during youth is probably motivational loss, a decrease in our ability to raise enough willpower to fulfill one goals. And most frightening is the risk for psychosis and schizophrenia, which might be even higher in people with autism that are more prone to psychiatric disorders. So why take unnecessary risks and even try medical cannabis in autism? So if, as we've already heard, the two main cannabinoids in the cannabis plant are THC and CBD. THC is a psychoactive component. It causes a high feeling but it is also the cause of all the risks that I have just mentioned. CBD, on the other hand, is not psychoactive, and it is also believed to reduce all the risks of the THC, it's anxiolytic, antipsychotic, and so on. As we have heard, there are many different strains or DNA lines of cannabis, and they work differently on the brain. Most of the recreational strains, or maybe all of the recreational strains probably, and most of the medical strains contain very high THC and very low CBD concentrations. And these strains are indeed not recommended for ASD, for autism, and also not for children. 
For children and for autism, we use strains with very high CBD and very low THC concentrations. And these strains are considered to be relatively safe. There are still risks, no questions about that. But these risks are definitely not unnecessary. The prevalence of autism spectrum disorder is rapidly growing everywhere. And today in the United States, one out of 40, even 40 children, is diagnosed with ASD. The core symptoms of ASD are persistent deficits in social communication and repetitive and restricted patterns of behaviors. About half of the children also have prominent behavioral difficulties, and unfortunately, about 40% of them do not respond well to the standard treatment and still have severe behavioral problems despite proper behavioral and pharmacological treatments. This is really a public health issue and novel treatments for both the core and the comorbid symptoms of ASD are rapidly needed. Animal studies suggest that the endocannabinoid system might be a good target for these novel treatments. As we have already heard from Dr. Sanchez, which is mu much nicer slides than I have, the endocannabinoid system is involved in many, it has many regulatory roles in our body, both in uh, health and disease states, but its main effect is neuromodulation, modulation of neural activity. Our brain works through circuits, as we already have already heard. When I want to raise my left hand, for example, neuron number seven activates neuron number 71, that will activate another neuron, and then I will raise my hand and the connection points between the neurons are being called synapses and the endocannabinoid system regulates the activity within these synapses it is being called synaptic plasticity and as we've already heard i will say it again uh, maybe it will be easier to remember so THC works in our brain through the CB1 receptor the cannabinoid type 1 receptor it binds the receptor and activates the adjustant G protein. And when a certain brain circuit is overactive, yes, then the enzyme NAP PLD can produce, for example, anandamide from phospholipids in the cell membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. The anandamide will cross back, I will just say that ananda in Sanskrit is extreme happiness, that why it is being called anandamide or AEA, the anandamide will cross back the synapse, will bind the CB1 receptor, that will activate the G proteins, that will open the potassium channels, and will stop the activity in this brain circuit. So, no modulation. We will see it in a short movie. No. Let's try again. Is there a possibility? Maybe I can do it through the computer. Yes. So if a brain, a certain brain circuit is overactive, you can see here the neurotransmitters. So if it's overactive, then anandamide will be produced also to AG from the postsynaptic neuron membrane. And now we can see it crossing back the membrane and it will bind the cannabinoid type 1 receptor in blue and then activates the G protein in green, which will close the calcium channels, open the potassium channels, and will stop the activity in this brain circuit. So the endocannabinoid system is strongly implicated in the regulation of social and emotional reactivity that are usually impaired in children with autism and also other behaviors that are usually impaired in children with autism, such as motivation, learning and memory processes, epilepsy, and circadian rhythm regulation. Deborah Carson and her colleagues from Stanford University demonstrated that the blood levels of anandamides are lower in children with ASD compared with uh, neurotypical children. And we also measured the blood levels of several endocannabinoids in the blood of 93 children with autism compared with 93 children 
uh, with typical development matched for age, gender, and BMI, and we found a much lower, substantially lower levels of endocannabinoids in the blood of children with autism. Now, animal studies uh, suggest that the blood levels of endocannabinoids reflect the brain levels, so this might be important. And it might also explain uh, or suggest a mechanism for the therapeutic effect of CBD, one of the therapeutic effects of CBD uh, in autism. So the two main endocannabinoids are 2-AG and anandamide AEA, as we have already heard. And anandamide has two structurally related compounds called oleilethanolamine and panmetoilethanolamine. So AEA, OEA, and PEA. And we found those to be lower in children with autism. These uh, three uh, endocannabinoids, they are being transported into the cells via the endocannabinoid membrane transporter, the EMT. Once in the presynaptic neuron, they activate the nuclear receptor, PPAR. And then they are being degraded by the enzyme fatty acid amide as we have already heard. This is a very important enzyme, fatty acid amide So we have found that these endocannabinoids are lower in children with autism, and CBD might compensate for these lower endocannabinoids by three of its actions. First, it directly activates the nuclear receptor PPAR. Second, it inhibits the enzyme fatty acid amide hydrolase, and if it inhibits this enzyme, it increases the levels of these endocannabinoids and also inhibits the transporter that transports them into the cell for degradation, and it also directly activates the TRPV1 receptor as anandamide do, does. So uh, maybe this is one of the mechanisms. More important, several animal, st animal studies uh, demonstrated alterations of the endocannabinoid system in animal models of autism, both monogenic models, polygenic models, and environmental models, and I will uh, demonstrate a few examples. So fragile X is the most common genetic cause for autism, and fragile X is a classic example of synaptic plasticity defect, so naturally the endocannabinoid system is involved, and in studies published uh, in Nature Communication in 2012, and a year later in Nature Medicine by a group from Barcelona, the, the researchers uh, found that uh, by manipulation of the endocannabinoid system, they can normalize the synaptic defects and also improve the behavioral problems in these models. Another example from another monogenic uh, model, norligins and norexin are cell adhesions protein that mediate the formation and also the maintenance of uh, synapses. And uh, when there are defects in these proteins, uh, they can cause uh, autism and also schizophrenia. And in animal models of uh, neuroligin defects, as the researchers found uh, alterations in the endocannabinoid tone, and by activating the CB1 receptor, they were able to substantially reduce the aggressive behavior of these relatively aggressive uh, mice. Another example from an environmental model, when uh, we expose pregnant rats to high dose of uh, valproic acid, uh, the offspring demonstrate symptoms of autism. And the researchers found that the high doses of valproic acid can uh, disturb the normal phosphorylation of the CB1 receptor, and if we will reactivate the CB1 receptor, for example, by inhibiting the fatty acid amide hydrolase, which will increase the anandamide, that is uh, the agonist of the CB1 receptor, we can reverse the, the autistic behaviors in this model. And a last example from a polygenic model, the BTBR mice, that also demonstrate autistic behaviors. 
the researchers found the same thing, that by activation of the endocannabinoid system, uh, we can reverse or substantially improve the social deficits and the aggressive behaviors. So animal uh, studies or preclinical studies suggest that activation of the endocannabinoid system uh, or administration of CBD uh, can improve the, both the core symptoms of ASD and also the comorbid disruptive behavior. Studies, clinical studies in epilepsy also uh, support this line of treatment. Uh, you know that up to 30% of the children with autism also have epilepsy and there are many uh, shared pathophysiological processes in both of these disorders. And in epilepsy, we already have very good clinical trials that support this line of treatment. In autism, we are not uh, there yet. In epilepsy, as we will probably hear later, uh, cannabidiol is already uh, FDA approved in certain uh, epilepsy syndromes. Recently, three uncontrolled case series uh, of children who have been treated with uh, certain types of cannabinoids, uh, these studies demonstrate substantial improvement in the behavioral problems and maybe also in the social deficits in children with autism. I will briefly describe the first study, the one that we have conducted. Again, all these three studies are uncontrolled case series. So when we have conducted this study, uh, cannabis was not legally approved in Israel for the treatment of autism. So we have received a special permission from the Israeli Ministry of Health to give it as a compassionate care. And accordingly, our participants were children with the most severe behavioral problems who have tried many other medications and it didn't work. And all of them received whole plant extract containing mostly CBD. 60 children were included, and the follow-up period was 7 to 13 months. Uh, most of the adverse events were transient and mild. I will go into details when I will describe the randomized study. But notably, one of our participants, an adolescent girl, developed a transient psychotic event which required an antipsychotic treatment. This happened while she was on 7 mg per kilogram per day of CBD and 0 0.7 mg per kilogram per day of THC. So 60% uh, of uh, the parents or the participants reported a substantial improvement in their child behavior following uh, this treatment. This is a, a lot. And about half of the patients also were uh, reported a substantial improvement in the core symptoms of autism, in the social deficits, which is maybe even more surprising or much improved or very much improved. Currently, there is no established pharmacologic, pharmacological treatment for the core symptom of autism. 40% of the participants reported substantial improvement in the anxiety symptoms. All the families uh, fulfilled a standardized questionnaire before the treatment and following the treatment, and in both questionnaires, uh, there was a 30% reduction in the behavioral score following the treatment. I am still following these uh, families and I can attest that in many of the cases it really changed their lives. And I will briefly describe two children. The first is Benjamin, not his real name. Benjamin is a 13 years old boy with low functioning autism. At the first visit, the parents reported that his siblings are afraid of him, they wouldn't get near him because he used to pull their hair, he would bite himself and everyone who happened to be around him, kick and scream. He had also severe sleep problems, and of course the parents tried many medications and nothing worked, so we have tried medical cannabis. And six months later, the parents reported that he is a completely different child, he is much calmer, uh, all his aggressiveness disappears, his siblings are not afraid of him anymore, he sleeps all night, 
and it even starts to communicate using few words. The second child is Eli, again, not his real name. When I saw him at the first time, he was five years old. Boy, his uh, cognitive and function and the uh, language abilities uh, were described as moderate, but he had severe behavioral problems. He used to bang his head into the wall whenever he was asked to do something. It was impossible to go out of the house with him to visit other uh, people or to invite people over. He used to run into traffic. He even set the house in fire once. Everything was locked all the time in the house. And of course, they've tried many medications and nothing worked. On examination, he was wearing a vest with weights in order to calm him down, but this didn't work. So again, we've started uh, medical cannabis, CBD reached, and six months later, again, the, the mother reported that he's a completely different child. All his self-inflicting violence has disappeared. All his restlessness is gone. There is no need to watch him. 24 7 and, and he was even supposed to attend a class with higher functioning due to his improvement on examination he was fully cooperative and calm so this sounds promising but we have to remember that in autism there is a huge placebo effect we know that from from the past we have seen that movie before and as we keep learning from epilepsy studies from this reason or another, in cannabis, the placebo effect is even higher compared with other medications, probably because of parents' expectation. And hence, we should be very, very cautious in the interpretation of uncontrolled studies, like the one I did. And so we moved on to a randomized study. And when we have conducted this study, we still had too many questions, we can say, should we use THC at all, or should we use only CBD? And if we use THC, what should be the right CBD to THC ratio? In the former study, we used a 20 to 1 ratio, but is this the right ratio? Should we use pure cannabinoids, which means only CBD and only THC, which is more standardized and repeatable? Or should we use a whole plant extract that retains the entourage effect, as we have heard, what should be the daily dose, what should be the target population in terms of age, level and function, and so on, what should be our treatment targets, the core symptoms of autism which have no other pharmacological treatment, or should we target the disruptive behaviors which are most bothering. And as she is saying, you cannot ask too many questions, but you can ask too many questions in a row, and we knew that, but we've tried anyhow. And we have come up with, we've ended up with a design that was somewhat uh, complex, but was intended to uh, answer most of these questions. So this was a double blind placebo controlled trial with crossover with 150 participants, and it had three arms of treatment. So the first arm was a whole plant extract of a strain that contained. 20 times more CBD than THC. The second arm was placebo, and the third arm was pure CBD and pure THC in the same ratio and the same concentration as the whole plant extract, but without other components of the cannab cannabis plant that can also contribute to the therapeutic effect. So there were two treatment periods of 12 weeks each, separated by four weeks for washout. 50 participants have been randomized to receive whole plant extract, 50 pure cannabinoids, and 50 placebo, and a different treatment in the second treatment periods. All the participants uh, were assessed using the EDOS, Vineland, and other assessments. Our two primary outcome measures addressed the behavioral problems of the children, the clinician global impression of improvement, which targets the specific behavioral problem of the child. You know that in autism, each child has his own behavioral uh, uh, problems, disruptive behaviors, and the home situation questionnaire for ASD, which targets uh, 
disruptive behaviors that are more common in the general ASD population. Our secondary outcome measures were the social responsiveness scale, which is an indication for core symptoms, severity, and the autism parenting stress index, which is mostly influenced by the behavioral issues. We also monitored adverse events every four weeks and whenever they occurred, but every four weeks the parents reported uh, it using a 34-item questionnaire. So as expected, 20% of our cohort were girls. This is the case in autism. And about 90% of our participants had low adaptive level or severe ASD symptoms. We had a 12% attrition that was well distributed across the study arms. And gladly, we had no treatment-related severe adverse events. You can see that mild adverse events in green were quite similar across the three treatment arms, but moderate adverse events in pink were more prevalent in the active cannabinoid arms in the pure cannabinoids and in the whole plant extract. So the most common adverse event was sleepiness and tiredness. You can see that it is more, more prevalent in the cannabinoid columns. The red one is the whole plant extract, the gray one is the pure cannabinoids, and the blue stripes is the placebo, so it's more common uh, in the cannabinoid arms. Also a decreased appetite, and weight loss, and maybe also euphoria. All other 30 adverse events that were reported were not more prevalent in the cannabinoid arms compared with the placebo. There were many adverse events, and they were very common, but they were more, not more prevalent in the cannabinoid treatment compared with the placebo. In epilepsy studies, the results are the same. Epilepsy studies which used only CBD, which used cannabidiol uh, alone, uh, they used the Pidiolex, they found the same, the most common adverse event was somnolent, and the second was decreased appetite, similar to our finding with CBD and THC, and for the efficacy. So for the behavioral assessments, there were no differences between the whole plant extract in red and the pure cannabinoids in gray. So about half of the participants significantly or substantially improved following the treatment and there was no advantage to the whole plant extract compared with the pure cannabinoids. When we have compared the cannabinoid treatments combined in green to the placebo in blue stripes, we found a significant difference between the cannabinoids and the placebo in the first treatment period and in the second treatment period in the clinician global impression of improvement in the specific behavioral problems of the participant. About half of the participant substantially improved, which means they had either much improved or very much improved uh, following the cannabinoid treatments compared with fifth, which is a, a relatively large number of the participants on the placebo. And in the other assessments, we found similar but less impressive results. First treatment period and second treatment period in the home situation questionnaire ASD and with the APSI. Surprisingly, we also found an improvement in the core symptoms of autism. And here you can see in the SRS2, which is an indication of the core symptom severity. And you can see that there is no difference between the pure cannabinoids in gray and the whole plant extract in red, but when we combine them together, there is a significant difference between the whole plant extract and the pure cannabis, and uh, between the cannabinoids, excuse me, and the placebo. Notably, there was also a, an effect on the BMI, so under cannabinoid treatment, participant lose weight and the BMI decreased compared with increase in the BMI when they were on the placebo. And this is important as most of our participants with ASD, are, most of our patients with ASD are overweight. And this decrease in the weight in the BMI was mostly in the overweight children, not in the skinny children. So this is a good thing. So to sum up all uh, my talk, this is a real uh, cover 
of uh, Newsweek. So it is asking, is marijuana the world's most effective treatment for autism? So my answer for that is probably not. But cannabinoids can expand our toolbox for treating the behavioral problems in children with autism, especially the overweight children. And there are also an indication for improvement also for the core symptoms of autism. Are we there yet? In my opinion, no. Further studies are needed and they are being conducted as we speak. For example, Dr. Eric Hollander from New York from Montefiore is conducting now a study, a randomized study with CBDV, which is an analog of CBD. Are pure cannabinoids as effective as whole plant extract? Our results suggest that they are. Am I convinced? No, I am not convinced. I was surprised by these results, but further studies are needed. Our results suggest that they are the same. Do we need some THC, Caesar, especially for the improvement in the social deficits? We don't know. We will look into that in our next studies. And last, the dose. In my experience, usually we can use lower doses of 5 milligram per kilogram per day of CBD, and we don't need the higher doses that we use in epilepsy. We can also just give it twice a day in most children, and we don't need to give the evening dose. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. We have three we or have four questions today. Yes, we have more than three or four. We have questions on the app. So, I will ask Rita Machado. Uh, Rita Machado. Can you raise? Uh, yeah, Rita Machado, right there. And the question is, what are the risks of the use of CBD for autism? Okay, so we have to divide it for short-term risks and long-term risks. So when I say short-term risks, we mean three months, for example, and I have patients who I treat with CBD-rich uh, compounds, let's say, for four or five years, which is also, let's say, short-term if we are talking about children. So short term, there are no, uh, in my opinion, uh, there are no uh, risks for irre irreversible uh, problems in children uh, with ASD. As we saw, uh, some kids have somnolence, uh, some kids lose weight, and it's mostly a good thing, but sometimes it's not a good thing, and uh, rarely we have to stop the CBD because of uh, the weight loss. But we can say that CBD, uh, as uh, in general is relatively safe for the short term. Uh, we know it also for epilepsy studies. When we combine CBD with other medications like valproic acid, sometimes we find elevation in the liver enzymes, but this is usually not a problem uh, because it's transient and we don't have to do anything. Uh, so no permanent short-term risks. Long-term risks, we don't know. Uh, we don't know yet. Thank you. So, Annabella Frazão, and if we can identify the, okay, right there. And the question is, did any of the children in the clinical trials have other pathologies that caused their autism, such as tuberculosis? Mm. Tuberculosis, yeah. sorry. Tuberculosis. So yeah, this, is, yeah. this is a very good question about, you know, what autism is not one disorder. It's uh, like a basket of many, many uh, disorders with different uh, etiologies. And uh, we have conducted uh, genetic, uh, genetic assessments, uh, which means whole, whole exome sequencing and uh, uh, chip. A DNA chip and also, of course, some of them had uh, severe prematurity and so on. But we cannot say uh, that children with what we call syndromic ASD, uh, which means that they have a certain syndrome like tuberous sclerosis or fragile X or shank 3 or whatever, had a better or a worse effect to cannabinoids. We thought that they might had a little bit worse effect, but uh, we cannot, uh, our cohort was not large enough to, uh, to make certain conclusions. Okay, we have time for one more. Boris Bonkin, yeah, here. 
Dr. Aaron, have you researched or observed the use of THCA for autism and its effects? There is some scientific evidence that THCA activates the PPRE pathway and it's used by some for autism and epilepsy. Thank you. So in clinical studies, I have never used THCA. I used THCA in some selected cases when nothing else worked and the parents really want and the company was willing to provide me with THCA. I cannot say much about it. I don't think that it's worked better. And again, I just had to say that even though THCA, as we have heard, is, should be not active, it can become active in the, our body and so on or in storage. So I, I cannot say anything about the safety of THCA right now and also not about the efficacy because I don't have enough experience. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.